Imagine a landscape steeped in divine visions and celestial signs, where the ringing of sword against shield reverberates across time-honored lands. Here, crusaders, knights and commoners alike, bound by faith and destiny, confront the daunting fortress city of Antioch. This isn't just a struggle for earthly territory or ephemeral glory. This is a defining moment where beliefs and aspirations will endure the harshest trials. As you take in the art and story that follows, let the nuances of the Siege of Antioch to leave you wondering, what if? Many unexpected events come together in this epical event that indelibly marked the course of history. In the year AD 1097, a spectacle of humanity and steel marched towards the Holy Lands under the clarion call of the First Crusade. Pope Urban II had ignited the fire in the hearts of the Europeans, promising salvation to those who would reclaim Jerusalem from the Seljuk Turks. Among the many cities that barred their way, Antioch was one not to be taken lightly. A sprawling fortress guarded by imposing walls and towers, situated strategically near the Orontes River. The city was a key to Jerusalem, and the Crusaders knew it. Bohemond of Taranto, a Normand prince, and Raymond of Toulouse, a seasoned French noble, were the leading figures of the disparate Crusader forces. Although they did not always see eye to eye, they shared a common goal – capture Antioch. They arrived outside the walls in late October, weary but resolute. Inside, Yagi Sian, the governor of Antioch, had expelled the Christians, strengthened the defences, and filled the storehouses. When Bohemond and Raymond first laid eyes on the impenetrable walls of Antioch, they realised the monumental task that lay ahead. Antioch was no ordinary city. It was a relic of Roman glory, once called the Queen of the East. Its walls had stood the test of time, and its battlements looked down disdainfully upon its would-be conquerors. The city was surrounded by a moat and featured 400 towers, each a stronghold in itself. Both Bohemond and Raymond knew that a prolonged siege would test their armies to the limits. The Crusader forces were a motley collection of knights, infantry and peasants, each with their own allegiances, languages and agendas. It was a volatile mix, prone to discord and disagreement. Early attempts to take the city by storm failed, exacerbating tensions among the Crusader leaders and troops. But their pushes were working. As the Crusaders tightened their grip around Antioch, Yagi Sian sent urgent messages for reinforcement. Meanwhile, he attempted to negotiate with Bohemond, offering gold, horses and safe passage in exchange for lifting the siege. The wily Bohemond pretended to consider the offer, but used the time to solidify his plans and wait for the right opportunity to breach the city. As the Crusaders settled into their siege, weeks turned into gruelling months marked by food shortages and disease outbreaks. Early attempts to breach the walls were futile. It was during this despairing time that Bohemond received valuable information from a turncoat inside the city. The Tower of the Two Sisters was less guarded at night. A secret pact was made, and on the night of June 2nd, a small group led by Bohemond scaled the walls. Scaling the Tower of the Two Sisters was no small feat. The men chosen for this dangerous mission were among the best climbers and fighters, their hands adept at wielding both grappling hooks and swords. When they reached the top and fought off the guards, they knew the fate of Antioch rested in their hands. The gates were opened, and the Crusaders flooded into the city. With the city captured, the Crusaders faced the monumental task of holding it. Their challenges were far from over. There was barely time to rest. Word came that a formidable Seljuk army led by Kerboga of Mosul was closing in to retake Antioch. The Crusaders found themselves besieged anew, this time as the occupants of a city they had just captured. The situation was dire, and the Crusader camps grew desperate by the day. Starvation, disease and desertion were rife. Many questioned the wisdom of defending a siege. Rumours swirled that the mission was cursed. The rumours of curse were well grounded. One shadow that loomed over the Crusaders was the absence of Alexios Thurskomnenos, the Byzantine Emperor, who had initially requested aid from the West against the Seljuks. As part of their oaths, many Crusader leaders had agreed to return any conquered lands to the Byzantine Empire. However, as days turned into weeks and then months, there was no sign of the Byzantine reinforcements that Alexios had promised. Word eventually reached the Crusaders that Alexios had turned back after hearing reports of their dire straits and the formidable forces arrayed against them. This perceived betrayal sowed distrust 
and ignited debates among the Crusader leaders, some of whom felt absolved of their oaths to the Emperor. While Alexios's absence was a source of disillusionment, there would be no relief force coming to help them. And so, the Crusaders prepared for the worst, fortifying their positions, rationing their dwindling supplies, and praying for a miracle. It was during these trials that Peter Bartholomew emerged from obscurity. Peter had already gained some prominence, claiming to have a few visions. But after a few nights of turmoil, Peter could not ignore them any long. St. Andrew revealed to him that the Holy Lance, a relic said to have pierced the side of Christ during his crucifixion, was hidden in the Cathedral of St. Peter within the city. A fervent search ensued, and a lance was indeed found. The relic's authenticity was debated, but its uplifting impact on the Crusaders' morale was undeniable. They took it as a sign that God was with them, but that was far from the last sign the Crusaders would receive. With this boost of morale came another unprecedented event. As both armies prepared for their fateful encounter, a celestial event seized the attention of both armies. A meteor streaked across the sky, illuminating the night with its ethereal glow, and then landed in Kerboga's camp. While its scientific explanation would be understood only centuries later, at that moment, it was interpreted through the lens of faith and superstition. To the Crusaders, the meteor was another divine sign, affirming that heavenly forces were at play to ensure their victory. It amplified the soldiers' belief in the righteousness of their mission, giving them a psychological edge in the battle to come. For the Muslim forces, however, it was an ominous portent, fueling doubts and fears that might have contributed to the dissension that eventually led to their downfall in the battle. The meteor, a neutral celestial body, thus took on contrasting symbolic meanings that had very real consequences on the battlefield. Another miraculous event came in the form of a vision. More than a few soldiers in the camp claimed seeing a vision of St. George, appearing as a knight in shining armor. He gave the beleaguered army the strength to face the enemy outside their gates. It was accompanied by a divine promise of victory, clad in battle-worn armor and bearing the holy lance, the Crusaders faced Kaboga's forces outside the walls of Antioch on June 28. Reports were that Kaboga expected to find the Crusaders ready to capitulate, but instead found the crusading army in high morale and ready for combat on the outside of the city. The battle was gruelling, filled with the clash of swords and cries of the dying. Just when the Seljuks seemed to gain the upper hand, their ranks were thrown into disarray. Rumours circulated that Kerboga had been betrayed by some of his allies. Whatever the case may be, the Crusaders seized the moment and routed the attacking Seljuk army. The siege was lifted and Antioch remained in Christian hands, but the cost was immense. Thousands had perished and the road to Jerusalem was still long and fraught with peril. Yet for a fleeting moment, the Crusaders felt invincible, basking in the glory of a hard-fought victory. The siege of Antioch was a crucible of human endeavor, testing the mettle and faith of those who took part. It was a chapter in a longer saga, fraught with suffering, sacrifice, and the grim determination to carry on against daunting odds. As the sun set on the fallen city, the Crusaders pondered the cost of their victory and what it meant to be favored by the heavens. The years would show that Antioch was a double-edged sword, a powerful symbol of their resolve but also a grim reminder of the toll such endeavors took on human lives and morality. The Battle of Antioch was more than a clash of arms. It was a clash of faiths and civilizations. The Crusaders believed they were the instruments of divine will, and when they saw the Seljuk forces in disarray, they took it as an affirmation of their belief. The ensuing victory was celebrated as a miracle, further solidifying the idea that their cause was just. The tale of the Siege of Antioch remains a mesmerizing saga of grit, faith, and the complexities of human endeavor, forever etched in the annals of history. I ask you again, what if? What if Antioch had not been betrayed from within? What if a lancehead had not been found after the visions of Peter Bartholomew? What if the meteor had not fallen, or had even shifted a few miles in trajectory and landed in the middle of nowhere? It has been said many times before, but at times, truth is odder than fiction. And in that regard, the Siege of Antioch is an extreme example of this trope of experience. Thank you. And if you enjoyed this tale, please remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel.